Good evening, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Believe it or not, it has been 20 years since September the 11th. The day four planes were hijacked, bringing down the Twin Towers in New York, crashing into the Pentagon outside DC and into a field in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. That single day would soon become perhaps the most consequential date of the 20th century, 21st century. 9-11 transformed, upended and destroyed so much around us. So many lives, both here and eventually abroad. People we know and others we never will. From a father going to work at the Twin Towers on that fateful morning in New York City, to a mother and son driving through Baghdad's Nisor Square just a few years later, there may never be a full accounting of all that was lost on and because of 9-11. But tonight, we're going to try. True to this show's ethos, we're going to discuss moments that aren't talked about facts that have been ignored, realities that haven't been faced. So ahead on this special edition of the show, I'll speak to some of the people who have shaped how we remember 9-11 and understand its long shadow that we still very much live in today. People who need little introduction, like Ali Soufan, the FBI agent who came so close to preventing bin Laden's attack on America. Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson, the former chief of staff to Bush Secretary of State Colin Powell. America's first Muslim member of Congress, Keith Ellison, now the Attorney General of Minnesota, and Americans whose loved ones died on 9-11. Depending on where you were that day or where you're from, what happened after looks quite different. But what unites so many of us from Lower Manhattan to London to Lahore is how much we lost in the wake of 9-11. The question is, will people, will our leaders learn any lessons from everything that's happened in the two decades since. When you walk past the Freedom Tower in New York City, you can't help but feel a little overwhelmed. The tallest building in the Western Hemisphere is more than a tower 104 stories high. It's a symbol looming over two haunting memorials, two gaping holes, whose emptiness represents so much that was lost on and because of one September morning. I just got to work uh, in the office and for some reason uh, it was early and somebody had a TV on watching the news and this whole thing started on live TV. We have a breaking news story to tell you about. Apparently, a plane has just crashed into the World Trade Center here in New York City. It happened just a few moments ago, apparently. We have very little information available at this point in time. In the absence of any clear information, as the dramatic reports came in, the voices of eyewitnesses filled the void with harrowing accounts of what they were seeing. It's quite terrifying. I'm in shock right now. I came out of the subway at Bowling Green. I was heading to work in Battery Park at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel. And Americans and millions of people the world over, including me in London, watched as jet after jet crashed into America's financial and military landmarks on that cloudless day. The band of 19 hijackers, mainly Saudis, not Afghans or Iraqis, led by an Egyptian named Mohammed Atta, were acting on behalf of Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda. They had boarded those planes, prepared to kill and die. American 11, are you trying to call? Nobody moves. Everything is okay. If you try to make any moves, you danger yourself and the airplane. Let's be quiet. America lost 2,996 people on 9-11. I feel terrible for the people that, that we lost, some of whom I talked to just 15 minutes before we lost them. In the rubble and the ruin, Americans would also come to face their vulnerability or as President Bush later put it, that the oceans no longer kept us safe. The last moment of American innocence when we looked up into that sky and saw that plane. And I think that's one of the things that people remember the most, even more than the image of the flaming towers, was that moment, that vibrant blue sky that was yeah. so innocent and so perfect. And then it was all shattered and the whole decade became uh, uh, this traumatic response really to this event. 
our war on terror begins with Al-Qaeda, but it does not end there. It will not end until every terrorist group of global reach has been found, stopped, and defeated. The past 20 years is the story of 9-11 and the global war on terror that it spawned. Five hours after American Airlines Flight 77 slammed into the Pentagon, and with Americans still trembling, Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld was already laying the groundwork for an attack on a country that had nothing whatsoever to do with 9-11. According to one of his aide's notes, Rumsfeld told his team, best info fast, judge whether good enough to hit SH at same time, not only UBL, referencing Osama bin Laden and Saddam Hussein. Go massive, sweep it all up, things related and not. America strikes back. Today our forces have begun the initial part of military operations in the war against terrorism. The U.S. would first invade Afghanistan in October of 2001 to go after Al-Qaeda training camps and topple the Taliban. It would become a 20-year war. One in which we'd lose trillions of dollars and thousands of lives, American and Afghans alike. We've now ended that war, the nation's longest, in defeat. America's left Afghanistan with the Taliban back in charge and Al-Qaeda having spread across the globe. There was another way. America had the sympathy of the world on 9-11. The presidents of China and Russia were sending personal messages of support to the White House. Across Tehran, Iranians held candlelit vigils for the victims. Yasser Arafat led a blood drive in Gaza. We are completely shocked, completely shocked. It was a chance for America to take the moral high ground in pursuing justice. But in a United States led by Bush, Cheney, Rumsfeld and Bolton. I had to see the Rumsfeld briefing. There would be no conventional law enforcement operation ending in an arrest, no diplomatic operation ending in extradition, no trials, no attempt by this Bush administration in particular to try and address the root causes of the terror and anger towards the United States. Instead, in January 2002, the world was shocked to see shackled detainees from Afghanistan arrive at what would become the notorious US prison camp in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. 9-11 was the moment a genuine global coalition against terrorism was forming. The State Department is recruiting Arab countries like Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, and even getting statements of support from Sudan, Yemen, and Syria. Even Libya's Gaddafi says the U.S. has the right to respond to terror. Russia is offering intelligence about Afghanistan. Even Iran, the U.S. says, itself a sponsor of terror, wants to reduce the threat from its Afghan neighbor too would be a lost opportunity. As one of the State Department's top negotiators with the Iranians later described it, in January 2002, one word in one speech changed history. Some of these regimes have been pretty quiet since September the 11th, but we know their true nature. North Korea is a regime arming with missiles and weapons of mass destruction while starving its citizens. Iran aggressively pursues these weapons and exports terror, while an unelected few repress the Iranian people's hope for freedom. Iraq continues to flaunt its hostility toward America and to support terror. States like these and their terrorist allies constitute an axis of evil. The die was cast. A host of lies were paving the way for an invasion of Iraq. The facts and Iraq's behavior show that Saddam Hussein and his regime are concealing their efforts to produce more weapons of mass destruction. And despite global opposition, America invaded Iraq in 2003. This is an NBC News special report. Target Iraq. It wasn't just illegal, according to the UN Secretary General, it was also a strategic disaster for America. And would soon become a humanitarian crisis for the Middle East. 
The casualties mounted. Thousands of American soldiers and hundreds of thousands of Iraqi civilians becoming the greatest recruiting tool Osama bin Laden could have ever dreamed of. Yet to this day, its architects have no regrets. All of those innocent Iraqi civilians, men, women, children, killed by US airstrikes, some of them in massacres at Haditha, Mahmoudiyah, Balad. None of those weigh on your conscience? None of those deaths ever keep you up at night? You don't know what you're talking about. The Iraqi battlefield of the war on terror would give birth to a new terror organization, ISIS. Terror attacks tonight in Paris. Two very loud explosions. ISIL is a direct outgrowth of Al Qaeda in Iraq that grew out of our invasion, which is an example of unintended consequences, which is why we should generally aim before we shoot. President Obama's approach to the war on terror marked a new chapter, disavowing full-scale invasions while ramping up drone strikes. The Jonas Brothers are here. They're out there somewhere. Sasha and Malia are huge fans, but uh, boys don't get any ideas. I have two words for you, predator drones. <laughs> you will never see it coming. The drone campaign expanded the map. We treat ourselves like we are in combat, but yes, we do, we do live uh, back over here in the States. We do get to go home every night. Now, American bombs were falling on new and distant countries, killing and injuring countless civilians from Pakistan to Somalia to Yemen and beyond, and with unintended consequences. If you push them against the wall, then it, this uh, militancy and terrorism is going to increase. If you're attacking them by drones and they're not part of the war, they have the uh, Taliban on the other side, who, which party they're going to join? Even Congress was warned. What the violent militants had previously failed to achieve, one drone strike accomplished in an instant. And service members wrote to Obama in 2015, calling the drone campaign one of the most devastating driving forces for terrorism and destabilization around the world. In the last year of Obama's presidency, we dropped 26,172 bombs on seven countries. Under Trump, we would drop record numbers in Afghanistan and Yemen, but we could not kill our way to victory. Osama bin Laden, the founder of Al Qaeda, a man with thousands of Americans' blood on his hands, has been killed in an overseas raid. For 20 years, we took out terrorist leaders, Zakawi, bin Laden, Awlaki, Baghdadi, and yet, the terror continued. If the global war on terror has been successful at anything, it's giving the world more war and more terror. It's given way to authoritarianism and nativism, the loss of civil liberties, an embrace of torture, rampant anti-Muslim bigotry and anti-immigrant animus, and it would come at great expense. Do you believe there is a straight line from 9-11 and the institutionalized Islamophobia and anti-immigrant sentiment and the rise of Donald Trump in 2016, 15 years later? Quite a straight line. We can see through what the politics unleashed by 9-11 were. Think back to that. There is a gauzy impulse to remember 9-11 as an awful day that led to a restored sense of national unity and purpose such thing. What it did instead was unleash an impulse very common amongst nativists that said America, its way of life, civilization as you know it itself is under siege by an unfamiliar foreign menace that shares none of your values and wants you dead. We have a problem in this country. It's called Muslims. We know our current president is one. Right. You know he's not even an American. We need this first question. This is man. First question. But anyway, we have training camps growing where they want to kill us. Mm -hmm. That's my question. When can we get rid of We're going to be looking at a lot of different things. And, you know, a lot of people are saying that, and a lot of people are saying that bad things are happening out there. We're going to be looking at that and plenty of other things. 9-11 was a day of profound loss. We lost nearly 3,000 innocent souls in the worst terrorist attack in this nation's history. 
we lost our sense of security and invulnerability. But looking across these two decades, we must reckon with what else we've lost. Our adherence to basic democratic values, to racial equality, our standing in the world, and our ability to claim a moral authority. In September 2001, there was another way. In September 2021, there is still that other way. One that is less violent, less divisive, less counterproductive. But only if we choose it. pursue nations that provide aid or safe haven to terrorism. Every nation in every region now has a decision to make. Either you are with us or you are with the terrorists. From the moment the plane struck the towers on that clear blue September morning, more violence seemed inevitable. Having failed to heed the warnings and prevent the attacks, the Bush administration became a war government. We got a war on terror, a Department of Homeland Security, the Patriot Act, color-coded terrorism warnings. And of course, we got not one, but two protracted major ground engagements in Afghanistan and Iraq. Violence that killed nearly a million people, according to Brown University's Costs of War project, including more than 7,000 American service members. Just weeks ago, Americans watched as the longest of its conflicts, Afghanistan, supposedly the good war, reached its ignominious end with the Afghan forces crumbling, the Taliban advancing, and the US scurrying to evacuate its personnel and allies. Osama bin Laden, the mastermind behind the 9-11 attacks, had already been dead for a decade, but Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, they live on. So was the war on terror a huge mistake, a failure? Are we safer today than we were two decades ago. I put a version of that question to Captain Florent Groberg, who received a Medal of Honor after he was nearly killed intercepting a suicide bomber in Afghanistan. You fought against these people. You got injured fighting in the quote-unquote war on terror. What is your instinctive reaction when you see stuff like that? I just hope that we never go back. Uh, you know, I, I really hope that um, this new Taliban government uh, follows through with its word and that we don't go back uh, because it's, it was a difficult 20 years for all of us. Joining me now are Ali Soufan, former FBI special agent and founder of the Soufan Center. He led the investigation into the Al-Qaeda bombing of the USS Cole the year before 9-11 and was described in a famous New Yorker piece as one of the few people whose work might have come close to preventing 9-11 itself. Also with me is retired U.S. Army Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson and a fellow at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. He was Colin Powell's chief of staff at the State Department and served in the Bush administration administration from 2002 to 2005 in that role, after which he became a ferocious critic of Bush's wars. Uh, thank you both for joining me on this special edition of the show. Let me start by asking you both, where were you on 9-11? What were you doing? What was your instant reaction when you heard or saw the news? Colonel Wilkerson first and then Ali. I was just coming back from a brief breakfast briefing uh, downtown in Washington and getting out of the taxi when the radio in the taxi began to announce it. And I told the taxi driver, turn up the radio, please. Let's listen. And 
we were listening, the second plane had already hit. I was hearing it over the radio for the first time, and I looked up, and the black smoke billowed over the Pentagon. Um, I thought at the moment, because of the transition briefings that we'd received from Dick Clark and others, Al-Qaeda has struck. Wow. So you even on that day were thinking Al-Qaeda had struck. Well, let me ask you, Ali, you were a man who was th thinking a lot about Al-Qaeda in the run-up to 9-11. Where were you on the day itself? What was your instant reaction as you saw those images on the TV or listened on the radio? I was in Sana'a, Yemen. I was in, uh, uh, in our embassy and we were planning for some meetings for that evening. Um, and uh, some you know, colleague uh, ran to the office and he said a plane hit the World Trade Center. And at the very beginning, we thought maybe, maybe it's a Cessna plane. And then, you know, soon later, somebody else said, you know, another train, uh, another plane hit the World Trade Center. I had no doubt in my mind that it was Al Qaeda then. Um, Ali, in that famous Lawrence Wright New Yorker profile on you in 2006, which later became the Looming Tower, you are described, you were described in that piece, it's how a lot of us first came across you, as the only FBI agent in the New York office who spoke Arabic, one of only eight in the country who spoke Arabic. You were the man perhaps most familiar within the bureau with Osama bin Laden, with Al-Qaeda. You had been tracking them, hunting them. I just wonder, you're in Yemen, you see this news, you're watching the TV. Was there a... I saw this coming moment. Was there almost a I told you so moment? We could have stopped this moment in your head at that moment? To be honest with you, no. Um, I think when I start to see all the documents later on, and we were, you know, my job is to identify the people who did this, and we start seeing their connections to Al Qaeda and the connections of a few of them to the USS Cole investigation. Um, I think I was I was feeling more betrayed than than I told you so. I was feeling that if that information was shared with us on a timely basis, maybe maybe the situation yes. could have been different. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, so many people in the intelligence community, so many people in the law enforcement community, realized the threat of Al Qaeda. Realized Al Qaeda was going to hit. Unfortunately, the administration at the time they did not want to focus on international terrorism at all. You know, even in the FBI, they put uh, international terrorism as like number 15 on the list, orders by the Attorney General of the United States at the time. So they wanted to focus on something else, and they thought terrorism is something that's made up. Colonel Wilkerson, you were in the administration at the time, which Ali says didn't put an emphasis on terrorism until 9-11, when suddenly it became the number one issue in America and the world. We know that on the day itself, President Bush, he goes on to Air Force One from the school. Dick Cheney's taken into a special operations bunker. Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld, he was helping the rescue efforts of the Pentagon, as well as later that day, telling his aides to come up with plans to go off to Iraq. You were, as you say, coming back from a briefing, you were a member of the State Department, you were a close ally of then Secretary of State Colin Powell. What was the mood inside the administration that day? Was it clear to you that day, that night, we were going to war and it was going to be a long war? Let me first say, Mitty, that uh, it's an honor to be on with Ali because he's one of the few people from those days that I have a lot of respect for. Um, what happened immediately, of course, was we went into evacuation. Everybody had to leave. That was that was the orders that came from the White House. Um, Richard Haas, the director of the policy planning staff, though, brought us back in to start planning a strategy for the next day or the following days, whenever Powell would have an opportunity to be free for President Bush. And what happened in the ensuing time after that was Powell presented what I thought was a brilliant strategy for essentially exploiting, and I use that term in a positive sense, the opportunity the glo the, of the global solidarity that had occurred because of all the people who'd come together. Uh, Article 5 of NATO was invoked for the first time. A million Iranians marched by candlelight and so forth. It was a tremendous moment of solidarity. Then the decision-making in that moment of rage and fear began to distort everything. And it became the military instrument that led the way, along with the CIA, and those two in tandem were a dangerous combination. And everything else started to deteriorate. All the strategy, purpose that we had in doing things that we needed to do in the world, small and large, doing them everywhere we needed to do them, began to fall apart. 
because we distorted it with the rage and the fear out of which this national security decision making took place. Never a good environment to make monumental decisions, fateful decisions, fear and rage. Ali, one of the themes of this show today, the biggest theme perhaps, is looking at what we've lost, both on 9-11 on the day itself and the decades following it. And given how much we're still living in the shadow of 9-11, how would you answer the question of what we've lost? What would you say we might not ever be able to get back? Well, we lost, um, we lost our reputation on the international stage. We lost our reputation with our own people. Um, you know, on the eve of uh, the Iraq war, 75% of the American public believed that Saddam was behind 9-11. Uh, and that is not true. Uh, we were sold a war against Iraq because of 9-11, uh, you know, and, and, and that war basically gave Al-Qaeda and gave the Taliban and gave many of the people that we were fighting at the time uh, a new life. Um, we lost uh, our uh, moral high ground on the international stage with a torture program that did no harm, as it did all harm, but no good. Um, we lost our reputation with our own population when we start doing illegal uh, surveillance programs on the American public, unconstitutional surveillance program. Um, you know, and that lack of trust that it created in the last 20 years between us and between our allies, between us and between our people, uh, resulted in uh, the environment that we live in today. It created people like Donald Trump. Uh, where, um, you know, unfortunately, they capitalize on that uh, lack of trust, that, 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 that broken system that already existed, and we caused it to exist in, in 20 years. Um, I think it's going to take uh, a lot to, to bring back, um, you know, our values, our reputation, the trust of our allies yes. and the people of the world. Um, you know, I think uh, the world saw us at our worst in the last 20 years. And if in order to reclaim our position in the, the world, it's time to remember, for us to remember, how we act at our best. Colonel Wilkerson, many of the architects of this war on terror, of the invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan in particular, they don't have a lot of remorse for what happened. George W. Bush, your former boss in a new BBC documentary series, here's what he says. Have a listen. And do you think your actions after 9-11 made the world a safer place? Uh, you know, there wasn't any other tax in America. Uh, we'll let the historians sort all that out. Let me just say this. I'm comfortable with the decisions I made. Colonel Wilkerson, is he right to be comfortable with those decisions? Do you agree that we're safer today than we were on 9-11? No, I do not agree with that. I think Ollie would bear that out, too. I think we've created more terrorists in the world. Donald Rumsfeld put it very pointedly to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Daryl Myers, at the time. He asked the question, he, as much as I hate to say anything about Donald, he asked a good question. He said, tell me how we're winning if every time we kill one of them, we create 10 more. And that's what we've done. Um, and let me just echo something that, uh, that Ali said also. Uh, and this reflects on George W. Bush, too. It reflects on him big time. When you're a power like America, empire that we are, but an empire with at least humanitarian instinct, supposedly, most of the time, and an empire whose reputation because of those instincts is as important a part of its real power as the military, diplomacy, economic and financial power. And you tarnish that reputation. Indeed, as Ali pointed out, you virtually destroy that reputation, especially with the torture program. You have really hurt your real power in the world. And we're going to see how badly we've damaged that power as we go forward and China, already the hegemon in the South China Sea and in East Asia in general, and Russia, craftily led by Putin, take advantage of our reputational damage and take advantage of our other strategic mistakes, which are manifest right now. Ali, I'm going to ask you uh, one last question based on what George Bush just said, based on what we heard Colonel Wilkerson respond to George W. Bush with. You followed Osama bin Laden earlier than most. You know what he was trying to do, the aim of al-Qaeda, perhaps the motivations behind the attacks on 
Did he succeed? Because he was killed in 2011. We carried on fighting. We've only just left Afghanistan. We're now commemorating the 20th anniversary of these horrific attacks. It's a horrible question to have to ask ahead of such a somber anniversary. But did bin Laden win? Did bin Ladenism win? Absolutely. I have no doubt in my mind about it. Look, before 9-11, bin Laden had 400 pledged members. Bin Ladenism today have thousands and thousands of people. Al-Qaeda alone have between 30 to 40,000 members. Remember, ISIS is also can be considered part of the bin Ladenism. So when you, when you look at all these things, you cannot say, oh, we're winning. You know, when we, when we had 9-11, I think we had one Salafi Jihadi terrorist group in the State Department. Now the numbers, I don't know how many we have. Um, so when you look at it, when yes. you look at the shared numbers of the operatives, the shared it, numbers of the groups, the areas that they control, the places that they operate at, I, they are winning and we're losing. Let's let's admit it. And it is because of the policies, not only of yeah. George Bush, not only of the Bush administration, but the policies of two Democratic administrations and two Republican administrations. That is undeniably true. Former FBI agent Ali Soufan, retired Army Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson, thank you both for your time tonight. Appreciate it. When we come back 20 years later and the questions that are still unanswered for people who lost loved ones that fateful day. Today's show is about the lessons of 9-11 and the two decades that followed it, but we can't tell that story without the people who lost their loved ones on that day. What do they think some of those lessons should be? What do they want as the lasting legacy of September the 11th and the legacy of their family members? People like Bruce Eagleson, who was attending a meeting on the 17th floor of number two World Trade Center. He was discussing plans to run the Trade Center's retail operations. After the first plane hit, Bruce began helping to evacuate people from the building. 13 of his employees got out of the building safely. He promised his oldest son he would also get out. But United Flight 175 crashed into the South Tower and he would not be able to keep his promise. Vanessa Langer was also working in the South Tower that day. At 29 years old, she was four months pregnant with her first child. Vanessa managed to flee the building. Like thousands around her, she tried running from the carnage behind her. But once the South Tower collapsed, she couldn't escape. Vanessa's body was pulled from the rubble on September the 24th, 2001. Today, 20 years on, families like Bruce's and Vanessa's are still searching for solace and in many ways still searching for justice. Here's how President Obama put it on the 15th anniversary of the attacks. You, the survivors and families of 9-11, your steadfast love and faithfulness has been an inspiration to me and to our entire country. And in your grief and grace, you have reminded us that together, there's nothing we Americans cannot overcome. The question before us, as always, is how do we preserve the legacy of those we lost? How do we live up to their example? And how do we keep their spirit alive in our own hearts? Joining me now to discuss this is Bruce's son, Brett Eagleson, and Vanessa's mother, Donna Marsh O'Connor. Um, Brett, 
Donna, thank you both so much for joining me on the show tonight. I really appreciate you taking time out. Let me start by asking you both a, a, a pretty obvious question, a tragic question. Donna, let me start with you. Where were you when you found out on 9-11 that there had been an attack? Did you see it on the TV? Did, some, did, did you get a call? What was going through your mind that day? Um, it was actually one of the weirdest, happiest days of my life. The night before, I had a terrible anxiety attack. Um, we were in Toronto for a film festival. My husband's book um, was made into a film and it premiered at the Toronto Film Festival. And my brother-in-law called on the cell phone as we were walking to the theater. It was the same glorious day in Toronto as it was in New York. And he said, don't you know what's going on here? And that's when the world fell. Um, I appreciate you talking about it with us after all these years. And I'm so sorry for your loss, Donna, and for yours too, Brett. Do you remember, I know you were a teenager then, what went through your mind that day? How did you hear the news about 9-11? I believe that day, Bruce, your father, was working in the World Trade Center too. Did you try and reach him? Were you able to speak to him? Yeah, so I remember I was a sophomore in high school in a local uh, small town here in Connecticut. And uh, I remember very vividly that uh, an announcement came on over the loudspeaker while I was in math class, and it said, um, please, everyone, report back to your homerooms for an important announcement, and um, thought that was very peculiar. And uh, we had reported back to our homerooms, and the announcement came with the loudspeaker that the World Trade Center had been hit. And uh, being from very far away from New York City, two and a half hours, no one really around me uh, had family there uh, that day. So I was the only one. I felt a bit isolated. And um, I immediately went to the office. This is before cell phones. I called my mom, and my mom had said, don't worry, your dad's, you know, dad's okay. Uh, your older brother Kyle had talked to him. My brother Kyle had spoken to him on the cell phone, and he survived both uh, plane attacks, both impacts onto the towers. And um, sort of just this sense of relief comes over you, thinking, oh, great, dad's okay. And I kind of just broke down and was so relieved. And then my mom said she was going to come pick me up. So by the time we, we got off the phone and my mom drove to school to pick me up, we had heard news that the towers had fell. And then immediately you go from this state of utter panic to sheer relief back to panic again, and then inset this whole probably weeks long process of unknowing and grief and anxiety and fear. Mm. Uh, yeah, I can't imagine what it must have been like for you then. And I just wonder, your father was a hero in many ways. He saved a lot of lives on 9-11. How would he want to be remembered? How do you remember him? Uh, he was a great person. You know, he, he died saving others. He was, um, had a great sense of humor. Uh, he was a great father and he always spent, uh, he, he loved his job and was dedicated to his work and, and devoted a lot of his life to his work. But at the same time, he made it a point to uh, make up for the time away by being our coach for baseball, basketball, soccer, for every sport. And he would help us with school projects and things like that. And, you know, I think what is the most devastating and sad part about all this is here we are 20 years later and we've told this story of grief, right? For 19 years in a row, we've gone on record and we've poured our heart out to America. You know, we're done with that. You know, it's 19 years in a row, the sad, sad story is kind of over and we have such a sense of anger and frustration with our own government, a government that has information on the murder of our loved ones, but still, still protects it under lock and key. And that's really why I'm here tonight is, is to talk about the anger yeah. that thousands of family members have at our own government from keeping information from us uh, that would bring justice and that would bring closure. So you are campaigning on this issue and I do want to talk to you about that in a moment. Um, Donna, I just want to bring you back into the conversation here. Just stick, just before we move on, just talking about the day itself and your family members. Your daughter, Vanessa, was just 29 years old and four months pregnant with her first child at the time. Do you remember the last time you spoke with her? What was she like? How would she like to be remembered? Um, Vanessa, <laughs> Vanessa was a force of nature. 
um, the last time I spoke with her, I I had an argument with her. I mean, actually, the last time I spoke on the phone, we were going to um, get together for a weekend. We just had three things, three weekends to get through, and 9-11 was one of them. Um, she was, um, in her 29 years, she owned a restaurant. She um, she moved from New York to Buffalo to Georgia. Um, she was a fierce, fierce advocate for her brother. She loved her brother so much. She was a football fan. Um, she loved the World Trade Center. They were born the same year, 1971, and I didn't even know she was in that building. She worked in the Park Avenue office of Regis Business International, and they moved to the World Trade Center. And I had a fear of those buildings. Um, like Brett, my my world was just over that morning in like a blink. Um, I remember trying to get home and nearly um, passing out in a phone booth before my, the cell towers were down so we couldn't reach anyone by phone. And I went through this, you know, desperate, I'll never see her again. She, That's outrageous. She is such a force of nature. There's no way, no way she's in that. Unlike Fred, I, I, I am still sad. I'm still in mourning. Maybe I've gone back to it because I started in rage. Donna, I'm so sorry, and thank you so much for speaking about this today. Brett, for years now, you and several other family members who lost loved ones on 9-11 have been part of a legal battle to try and get more answers, more transparency, in particular about Saudi Arabia's alleged role in the attacks. This year, former Saudi officials were questioned under oath as part of this lawsuit, which remains sealed. Uh, and despite the fact that most of the 9-11 hijackers were from Saudi Arabia, not Iraq or Afghanistan, the Saudi government denies any involvement. They released a statement just this week saying any allegation that Saudi Arabia is completely Implicit in the September 11th attacks is categorically false. Brett, tell us what is your goal with this lawsuit? What do you want to get to here? Look, these are the same people that are denying that Saudi Arabia had any involvement with the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. So they come out with a statement today saying that we're categorically false. Well, then I challenge them. Why don't they, why don't they petition the judge to lift the protective order of all the depositions that our legal team has had in this lawsuit? Why is everything being done behind lock and key? Why are 24 Saudi government Arabian officials who are ordered to report in court to give depositions, why is their testimony secret? And if the Saudis have nothing to fear, then put their money where their mouth is and why don't they, why don't they petition the judge to allow the, the American media to follow this lawsuit? You know, it breaks my heart. I'm just, I'm, I'm listening to Donna's story and I'm, I'm tearing up, I'm crying because it, there are thousands of stories like this. And, and, and we are heartbroken. And our government doesn't have our back. Our government denies us the closure. Our, why isn't the government taking our side? You know, you know, President Biden um, should be taking our side. And he made the first critical step on Friday where he said he wanted to declassify this information. So what we're asking for, and sorry to kind of get off tangent a little bit, but what, what we're asking for is the, is the investigative files that our own FBI, that our own government has on the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. We'll have to leave it there. Brett Eagleson and Donna Marsh O'Connor, thank you so much for your time tonight. And again, we're so sorry for your loss. How much changed after 9-11? And how much did it reveal who we truly are? My conversation with the first Muslim Congressman, Keith Ellison, next.
the face of terror is not the true faith of Islam. That's not what Islam is all about. Islam is peace. Muslims have the right to practice their religion as everyone else in this country. And that includes, that includes the right to build a place of worship in a community center on private property in lower Manhattan. Donald J. Trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States until our country's representatives can figure out what the hell is going on. For the last 20 years, the U.S. has had a tumultuous, I think it's fair to say, relationship with its Muslim community. For all of George Bush's words against anti-Muslim hatred, hundreds of Muslims were arrested and deported, many more spied upon under his administration after 9-11. And Islamophobia exploded during Barack Obama's presidency, with right-wingers claiming he was a secret Kenyan-born Muslim. And as for Donald Trump, well, he's Donald Trump. He's also, of course, from New York City, whose police department targeted Muslims in a now defunct but sprawling surveillance program on Mayor Michael Bloomberg's watch. But it wasn't just Muslims. The Patriot Act, a national security agency, allowed mass surveillance of Americans across the board in the wake of 9-11. We used to have a color-coded terror alert system. We can't even get on planes anymore without the TSA checking our shoes. Still, on the upside, we have more progressives in Congress today fighting for our civil liberties. We have more Muslim Americans among our elected leaders. Before he was Minnesota's Attorney General, Keith Ellison was the first Muslim elected to Congress. In 2011, he gave emotional testimony before his colleagues at a hearing on quote-unquote Muslim radicalization. I spoke to him about what's changed for Muslim Americans since 9-11. Keith Ellison, thanks so much for joining me on the show tonight. Let's start with 9-11 itself. Where were you? What do you remember your immediate reaction being when you heard or saw the news of this terrorist attack on America by Al-Qaeda? Well, I had been practicing law for about 11 years. I, had not, I was not in politics of any kind other than just sort of a local activist. Uh, and uh, that day, my wife and I had bought a couch the delivery guys are bringing it in, TV's on, and we see one plane go into the building. Like, oh my God, what in the world just happened? And then a few minutes later, another one hit, and we were like, wait, that, that's, that's not an accident. That's not a sad tragedy, a tragic accident. That, that's deliberate. It's really changed our country from that moment onward. Now, I want to talk about being a Muslim in the wake of 9-11 right. for a moment. The Economist and New York Times columnist Paul Krugman tweeted on September the 11th last year, and I quote, overall, Americans took 9-11 pretty calmly. Notably, there wasn't a mass outbreak of anti-Muslim sentiment and violence, which could all too easily have happened. When you read something like that, given what you know Muslims in America did experience, what's your response? What did you experience as a Muslim? Well, um, I can tell you that um, I just had too many friends uh, to count who were kicked off airplanes, who were, uh, um, you had uh, people, agents of the state, whether it's FBI or immigration authorities coming to their homes, asking them questions. There was a real um, uh, intensive effort for so many people I, I've, I've had a chance to get to know and meet. It was a lot of, uh, it was a troubled time for the community. And uh, the, the Muslim community yes. became, was fearful. In 2006, you became the country's first Muslim to be sworn in as a member of Congress, along with Andre Carson. And a week after the elections, you appeared on Glenn Beck's show, then on CNN's headline news channel. Have a listen. I have to tell you, I have been nervous about this interview with you because what I feel like saying is, Sir, prove to me that you are not uh, 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 working with our enemies. And I don't, and I, I know you're not. I'm not accusing you of being an enemy, but that's the way I feel. And I think a lot of Americans will feel that way. Well, let me tell you, the people of the 5th Congressional District know that I have a deep love and affection for my country. Uh, there's no one who is more patriotic than I am. 
It was an outrageous thing for anyone to say on live on national television, and you really shouldn't have had to stress to him your patriotism to Glenn Beck right. and all people. So, so I wonder, do you feel you would answer that question differently today? Glenn Beck is a, is a theatrical performer. He was hoping to get some sort of an emotional rise out of me. He was hoping to uh, try to get me to apologize for being a Muslim or to somehow uh, you know, set him at ease that I'm not some danger to him. Bottom line is, you know, I think that the way I answered him was fine because he didn't deserve more than what I gave him. I wonder, do you feel that anti-Muslim sentiment, Islamophobia over the past two decades here in America has been normalized not just by conservatives, but by many liberals too. I want to play you a clip from Bill Clinton's DNC speech in 2016. Have a listen. If you're a Muslim and you love America and freedom and you hate terror, stay here and help us win and make the future together. We want you. If you love America, help us win. This idea that Muslims are outsiders and only have value if they hate terror and help fight the so-called war on terror. It's become pervasive across the political spectrum, hasn't it? Yeah, you know, I do hope that the kind of sentiment expressed there is 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 really going away. I mean, but you know, there is this just fundamental presumption that uh, that America belongs to people like Bill Clinton, you know, and and not to others, and that we're here because uh, he tolerates us, uh, he allowed us. Not not so. I mean, here's the thing: Muslims have been in the United States since the very founding of the country. Uh, here is, is, is as early as anyone except for indigenous people, except for Native Americans. I mean, as many of a, as many as 10 percent to a third of all the Africans who were kidnapped on the shores of West Africa were Muslim. Even Thomas Jefferson owned a Quran. So did others as well. And so, yes. you know, for Bill Clinton to say what he said, you know, just sort of demonstrates sort of a, a, a presumption of his centrality. And yes. I don't I don't I don't buy it. In December last year, Keith, the Supreme Court unanimously ruled in favor of three Muslim men whose lawyers argued they were put on the no fly list for no reason other than retaliation because they refused to become government informants, which violated their religious beliefs. The ruling allows them to now sue the FBI agents for monetary damages. In one case with a man named Mohammed Tanvir in 2007, FBI agent threatened to take his passport unless he spied on his community. It wasn't just Islamophobia, was it, that Muslim Americans faced after 9-11? liberties were taken away too oh you know there was the insiers program a government-sponsored program where a lot of muslim men uh who uh were were i believe only could be described as harassed within the context of the immigration system um i don't know if that particular individual was caught up in the sweep uh connected with the insiers program but it was a program that targeted muslims most mostly young muslim men uh, for deportation and uh, tried to force them into, uh, you know, sharing information uh, about the Muslim community. Of course, the New York Police Department was caught uh, having a, a fairly extensive Muslim, um, you know, investigative community program. There was a lot of mistakes made. Hope we learn from these things. Um, yes. I really do. So, but, you know, at this moment, you know, one wonders. Last quick question. Did we lose the war on terror? Well, you know, I think that it is important to do kind of a post-mortem on 9-11, uh, particularly given the exodus from Afghanistan. I mean, obviously, it was a criminal act that was perpetuated on the United States. It was a military act, and it also was a diplomatic offense. And we should have said, look, this is not a traditional war. Uh, in the sense that we've become used to it, it's going to have non-traditional, the best response will be non-traditional. It will be a combination of reaching out to the diplomatic community, the international community, to stop this kind of thing, share information, to hold yes. people accountable, like in a court, show that our, list, our system of values is greater than the one they're standing for. Uh, and so, I mean, I think that we missed an opportunity uh, because we reacted with anger, which is completely understandable, but yes. when you're responsible for running a society, I think you've got to respond with, uh, with, uh, with a little bit more thought and a whole lot more humanity and, and, uh, and reason than, than we did, than our leaders did.
Well said. Keith Ellison, thanks so much for your time tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you. The war on terror has been called the long war, but really nothing about the past 20 years feels that long to me. These two decades since 9-11 have almost felt like a blur. Just making this show and looking at all the archive footage has been a real reminder of that. Covering terrorism, covering uh, George W. Bush and Tony Blair and more recently Donald Trump, in so many ways a product of 9-11, came to define my career as a journalist on both sides of the Atlantic. And personally, as a Muslim, I've spent the past 20 years trying to stand up to both Muslim extremism and anti-Muslim bigotry. And like many Muslims, I've also spent years trying to explain to people that the 19 hijackers on those planes shouldn't define me, my faith, my community, any more than white Christian America should be defined by the actions of those insurrectionists who attacked the Capitol on January the 6th. No, it isn't a cliché. 9-11 was a day on which everything changed. But what kind of change? Osama bin Laden could never destroy us, no. But we proved over the past two decades that we have the capacity to destroy what we hold most dear. And so we lost so much that we didn't have to lose. Not just innocent lives, but our values, our principles, our faith in our fellow humans, our trust in one another, our sense of security, not to mention trillions of dollars on failed wars abroad. We owe it to all those victims of 9-11, both the thousands of named innocent Americans killed on the day itself and the hundreds of thousands of unnamed innocent people who died in our subsequent wars to find another way, to put justice over vengeance, to say never again will our response to terror produce only more terror. Good night.